Hey guys, so I'm on my way home from work now. Just gonna set the camera up a little bit here. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if it's actually gonna record or not, but let's give it a shot. So, <clears throat> earlier today I put out a video and it talked about uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life and how it's important um, and how we're supposed to be peacemakers and uh, just all of the things that make, in my opinion, our walk of faith, if you will, our representation of Jesus in this world, uh, important in a lot of different ways. And so, you know, how do we take our lives, which were at one time broken and dead, and that God has rebirthed at the time of our repentance, and how do we take that life and make it as alive as possible? Uh, what do I mean by alive? So how do you make your life as effective for the gospel as we possibly can? If I'm supposed to represent Jesus on this earth as part of his body, then I think that I'm supposed to be effective in what I do, because Jesus was very effective. I think I'm supposed to get along with the other members of the body, and we're supposed to work together, and <clears throat> regardless of the <clears throat> part of the body that I think I am, God knows the part of the body that I truly am. He knows what I'm supposed to be. He knows what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to do it, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we talked about this earlier. That's what the Holy Spirit reveals to us. First Corinthians 2, I say it all the time, talks about how the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of Christ to us. What he is thinking and planning for us, the vision for our lives, is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Um, and so if we don't have that living, breathing relationship with the Holy Spirit, a very intimate relationship with that Holy Spirit, we're going to be wondering for the rest of our lives what exactly it is that God has actually made us to do and made us uh, to be. So, you know, I think about the body of Christ. I think about uh, around the world, the thousands, I believe six or seven thousand different denominations and I think about how the enemy has successfully split the church uh, from being a body, from being unified, from being uh, a force that works together in different parts, a hand here, a foot there, a brain there, you know, whatever it may be, Christ being the head, of course, or the leader of the entire body. I, I think of that, <clears throat> and I think of how the enemy has separated us and has diluted not just our power, because we work together in the power of the Holy Spirit to do ministry, but our effectiveness, right? And, and I see a difference between those two things. I see power as being the things that happen when we show up and we represent God and the miraculous happens. Uh, for instance, you have a cold. I show up. I pray for you. I use the authority given to every believer to heal the sick raise the dead, cleanse the leper, as I said, you know, go into all the world, um, because I've given you the total authority, if you will, it's all been given to me and I give it to you. Well, if I come and I do that, that is the power of God flowing. And, and the analogy that uh, people use all the time that I just really love is right now I'm driving down the highway and I'm coming up to a, a green light. Well, if I see that light turn red, that light has the authority to stop me, right? I have to stop for a stupid little light bulb. Someone gave that green light a purpose and it stops me even though it has no power in and of itself to stop this truck, it will stop me. And what happens if I don't stop? The power of God shows up behind that <clears throat> and enforces it. But in this case, God is the government, little g, and I get a ticket. I might even get my truck impounded if I do it often enough and I could lose my license. They have the power to ruin me, to destroy me as far as driving on the roads go. And so we as believers have authority given to us by Jesus. He said, all authority under heaven and on earth has been given to me and I give it to you. <clears throat> Who's you? You is you. You is you, you and me and everyone else who's a Christ follower. And so I see um, the difference between those two very, very distinct. So what do we do with the influence that we have as the body of Christ 
when the body of Christ is split into thousands of pieces, excuse me, thousands of pieces. Denominationalism, tribalism, all of these things that separate us into categories or uh, categorize us, if you will, those things are not of God. Now, God does categorize us in some ways. He says that some are gifted to be apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. Some have the gift of healing, the gift of the word of knowledge and prophecy, and some can uh, speak in tongues for the purpose of the church and have it interpreted, and together the tongue and the interpretation brings about a word of knowledge or a word of prophecy for the church. All those things are categories, but they're not categories that divide. Those are categories for unification and for the edification of the church and just for everything that's positive for the growth of the church. So why do we allow the enemy to divide us? Why? I'm just going to pick on a couple of denominations. Why do I, if I was Presbyterian, have a problem with a Pentecostal? It's because of doctrine. It's not even a salvation issue. It's a doctrinal issue that I disagree with them on interpreting some of the verses in the Word of God. Why do I, as a Pentecostal, have a problem with a Baptist? Which I don't, by the way. I need to be very specific about that because I happen to be... I come from the Pentecostal background and attend a Baptist church. So I just got myself in trouble. Not really. It was not a Freudian slip, okay? I love my leadership. I love the, the church that we go to. It's incredible, by the way. If you're in New Jersey, you should visit it. Clinton, New Jersey, Southridge Community Church. Very cool. Very good people. Very good, good teaching. Solid biblical teaching. So why do, why do we have problems with different denominations? Here I am giving into authority right now. There's a yellow light. I'm slowing down. Why am I slowing down? Just want to drill that into your head. We have authority because Christ gave it to us the same way these lights have authority to stop me. Why are we not using our authority? But um, so, boy, the shadows are kind of cool. I can give myself a mustache. Oh, now I'm green. Um, <clears throat> the Hulk. Why do we allow the enemy to separate us? Why do we allow the enemy? Can I do this? Yeah, I sort of can do that. Why do we allow the enemy to take the body of Christ and amputate parts of it and convince that part that it can go off into the corner all alone with other parts that are sort of like it and hang out together and think that they're an active, healthy body of Christ in this world? we got a whole bunch of hands off in the corner clapping with each other and doing nothing else. They can't lift anything because they're not attached to arms got a bunch of arms that have driven the hands out of the church because they say, oh, well, we don't believe in grabbing, right? So, I mean, I'm using silly examples, but the enemy has literally made the church ineffective in many ways because we can't have unity. We can't be peacemakers. We can't work with somebody who doesn't believe exactly the way I do. We don't believe that God can move on someone else. Pentecostals, I'm going to pick on you for a second. The charismatics out there, the full gospel, word of faith, all those folks, right? I'm going to pick on you for a minute because uh, for years I've been running around in, in those circles, uh, sort of came to Christ in those circles, and I've noticed um, just real seriously, the Catholic faith. I'm a, I'm a Sicilian, so I sort of have Catholicism running through my veins whether I like it or not. But the Catholic faith is like demonic to you guys, to us, I should say, because I'm part of it, and I take some responsibility for that. But there are Catholics out there who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced, if you will, by speaking in tongues. And there are people out there who have gifts from God within the Catholic Church that verify their faith and they call Jesus Lord and they believe significantly differently than you do but never once never once do I see Paul walking into a, a specific area and he says you know the way that you believe is wrong and so you're not saved with this secondary doctrine now there are huge doctrines the non-debatables Jesus is God um, things like that that are not debatable but this whole faith-filled experience with the Holy Spirit and us you know saying that we have everything and some other denomination doesn't have it that's a lot like Phariseeism that's a lot like saying it's my club I understand the truth you don't and Jesus talked a lot about those people so 
I just wanted to call you guys out on that. I didn't mean to pick on Catholicism, but that's the most drastic difference that I could really think of. Uh, and so I, I did point that out. But uh, don't get hung up on the denomination that I mentioned. Do me a favor, get hung up on the challenge that we're supposed to be more loving. The Word of God says that they will know us by our love. It doesn't even say that they will know us by our love for them. It says that we will know us by, by they will know us by our love for one another. See, now I can judge you and you can judge me by the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life. What works do we do? What are the things that God has poured out in our lives? But the outside world who doesn't know Jesus is going to judge us and know us because we love one another so deeply and that they can't figure out why we do the amazing things for one another within the church. That's how it's supposed to work. Read the Bible, you'll see that's what it says. Yet here we are, <laughs> divided, fighting with other denominations. I remember back in the 1990s, I took a road trip to a, uh, a Bible Belt state. I won't say which one, um, but we're down there in the Bible Belt. And I remember walking into, it's probably a Walmart or something like that. I don't know what they had back then, Sam's, I don't know. Whatever it was, I walked in there. And when I came outside, there were literally people waiting outside of this supermarket, this convenience store, whatever you want to call it. And they're waiting there to find out, am I a Christian? And what denomination do I come from so that I can, uh, you know, learn the truth from them? And you know something? They weren't too far off from the faith system, if you will, the, Christian, the, the flavor of Christianity that I came from. And I was embarrassed to say that there are actually groups of Christians who are trying to convince other groups of Christians they're doing it wrong instead of working together and doing what's right. My job is, first of all, to build up those who God has put under my leadership umbrella. So if you're in a discipleship group I'm leading, if you're in a church that I'm going to and I'm a leader in and you happen to be under my leadership in a small group or maybe I'm leading a ministry and you're within that ministry serving, I have the authority to come into your life and to give you advice and to talk to you and all of that. But if I'm a stranger, yeah, I'm supposed to know the truth. I'm supposed to know the word of God, but I don't have the right to just walk up to total strangers and say, you're an idiot. You're not believing correctly. Actually, I can't say that as your leader either, but you know, that's what people are thinking when they're providing leadership. Sometimes it's like, oh, I got to fix this. I got to teach this person. Right? So I don't have the right to walk up to strangers and just provide correction in their lives. That's not the way the biblical model works. If I have a pastor, he has the right to speak into my life. If I have a small group leader over me, he has the right to speak into my life. I've willingly subjected myself to that person's leadership. That's what happens when we become Christians. We willingly subject ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Before then, we didn't. We were dead in our walk. We had no relationship with him and we weren't going anywhere with him at all, including in eternity. Well, in life, man, it's like, you know, if God doesn't have the ability to override my free will, because he says he won't force himself, if you will. Read, read the word of God, you see it's not a forceful conversion. I have to choose him. If God doesn't have the power to come in and force me to not sin, to do the right, excuse me, to do the right thing, what makes me think that I have the power or the authority to do that with you? What makes anyone think they have the authority to do that? In fact, I, I think it's in the book of James. Um, man, I think it's, uh, oh man, I think it's an angel fighting with the devil, if I remember correctly, over the body of Moses. Um, and the angel didn't even dare um, condemn the devil. Like he didn't even correct him because it's not even his job. And he is living with the very presence of God around him all the time in eternity already. So the angel couldn't even uh, uh, condemn the devil himself, right? He said, the Lord rebuke you. And yet here I am, here you are, here the church is, we sort of condemn one another. And I know I'm bouncing sort of all over the place. First of all, I'm sharper in the morning. Um, in the evening, my, my brain is not nearly as focused. But there's a lot of important stuff here that I just wanted to sort of, forgive the term, vomit out of my mind. 
unity of the church. Can't imagine the progress that we would make in the world if we would all work together in the faith. And so your brother may not have it exactly right, may have it really wrong actually, but still be trying to follow Jesus. Well, you know where discipleship is going to come from? When you guys work together and you wind up collaborating and iron sharpens iron and he's going to learn a truth from you um, and you might learn a truth from him and God uses one part of the body to work on another part of the body. But when you dismiss an entire part of the body or an entire section of the body, you've, uh, you've broken the body of Christ. You've basically made our faith ineffective in this world, our action, our works. It's the way I look at it. So let's talk about discipleship for a bit since I touched on that. Uh, why is it that we think giant churches with superstar pastors up front providing awesome teaching and great music and uh, all this kind of stuff is the way to reach people for Jesus? Yeah, I mean, it's attractive, gets people in the door, maybe it gives us an opportunity to talk to them. Hopefully you've got a real strong program behind the scenes that's taking those folks and actually uh, providing leadership to them as far as training and bringing them up in the Word of God, encouraging them to walk more closely with the Holy Spirit. You know, there's all of these things that we do in our churches today. If we have a church of, you know, 500 people, we're bigger than the average church throughout the entire nation. If you have a church of 1,000 people, man, you're really succeeding. You're, you're an awesome pastor. You're going to get invites to talk all over the country and maybe all over the world after COVID-19 is gone. Time stamp this a little bit. That's what where we are right now. Uh, you have a church of 10,000? I mean, you're a mega church pastor. And mega church pastors, they're either loved or they're hated by people, right? So you either have people who think they're the Antichrist <laughs> or they think they're, you know, the best pastor to ever walk the earth. And they're they're quite literally lifted up as superheroes. And, uh, man, you got to hear my pastor. you got to hear what he says. you got to come to church and see how we do it and all this. That's not what church was ever meant to be. Yeah, they gathered in large groups, but because people were getting saved in large numbers, right? After they got saved, they went off into their homes and they had home churches. They were hiding. The Bible, if you will, the scriptures was put in what they call a codex or into a book because they couldn't carry scrolls everywhere and hide it, right? Let me fix this camera a little bit. They couldn't, um, can't fix the camera. So they, they couldn't hide scrolls under their robe, if you will. So they made little books and they carried around portions of the scripture with them. And they would carry around the letters from the apostles and they would share them in different places verbally to people who probably couldn't read most of the time. And frankly, the church didn't even have Bibles in their hands, right? Until like the 1700s because the printing press didn't exist. So most people had to hear it from someone else. Well, when I can promise you this, uh, there was division in the New Testament. Somebody would show up and say, I bring Paul's message, so listen to me, because Archippus, the Christian pastor of this church, is not as good as Paul. And I just made up a Greek-sounding name. Um, but you know something? Eventually, that was something that was worked on as well. They said, why do you call yourself a disciple of Archippus or a disciple of Paul or a disciple of somebody else? Don't you know that we all follow Jesus? So discipleship back then and discipleship today is supposed to be about meaningful, uh, authentic, uh, vulnerable relationships with those around us. We journey together with Jesus. We don't show up on Sunday and go, man, that seat was comfortable. I love the, the, the uh, carpet and the preaching was great. And boy, the music, I felt like I was in a concert. Yahoo, hallelujah, time to go home. That's not what church is about. Church is about showing up, sharing in the triumphs and in the struggles and all of that of our journey with Jesus and sharpening one another and growing in our knowledge of the word so that our intellect is right and growing in our knowledge of how to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit uh, so that our walk is right. Uh, I just, I don't get it. So I'm probably going to post this video as the various ramblings of a frustrated man because my heart is, is very sad at the state of the, the current church. My heart is very sad that we're a broken, divided body, that we think discipleship is all about going and hearing the most awesome preacher on Sunday at the biggest church. 
You know, when you walk into church, the music is supposed to point your eyes to Jesus. You're not even supposed to notice <laughs> whether the music is good or not. We're all worshiping together. Who cares if the person sings off tune once in a while or if, you know, the guitar is out of tune or if they're not in perfect sync? Who cares? It's about Jesus. It's not about some stupid performance. Yeah, it's great when there's a great performance, but that's not what church is about. It's not about teaching the perfect sermon. It's about equipping the saints. It's about getting people that are strong in their faith in everything they do. I want to be a Christian that's strong in my faith in everything I do. I want to be a Christian, a Christ follower, who wakes up in the morning and says, what can I do to make other Christ followers stronger in their walk? How can I help them to heal their wounds, to bring the crap out of their broken soul and out of their broken minds, out of their habits, out in the open where Jesus and their brothers and sisters can work on it with them, to bring healing? It's the kind of Christian I want to be. I want to represent Jesus as best as I can in this world. I want to touch people and bring healing. I want to speak words of healing. I want to embrace the leper. And I want to be able to forgive those who do the unthinkable. The murderers, the prostitutes. I want to show them the love of Jesus. I want to care for the poor. I want the widows to have hope and joy in the midst of their incredible deep sadness I hope you feel the same way <sighs> yeah Lord let your Holy Spirit just fall on all of us I pray that every person if you're with me right now and you're feeling the same thing that I am your frustration and your heart's open to this just pray this with me Lord let your Holy Spirit fall on us baptize us fill us with purpose, direction, power. Let our tongues speak in the language of angels and of men. Let your Holy Spirit flow in and through us in everything we do. Let us be filled even as we're being filled. That's what the Greek talks about when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's filled and filled and filled. It's an ongoing thing. God, please let that happen to us. Please let that happen to me. Let me love like you love. In Jesus' name. If you're looking to get discipled, if you're looking to grow stronger, I want to encourage um, encourage you in this. There's a book out there called Discipleship Essentials by Greg Ogden. You can pick it up on Amazon or on his website. It's a workbook. Get the hard copy workbook. Sit down with three other people. You all should have your own copies. And work through that book together. It's the most powerful discipleship experience outside of a relational experience with a leader that I've ever had. It's not the answer. Uh, you still need to find a church. You need to be involved in a local body. And maybe those four of you are the only Christians in your area. Maybe that's your body. I don't know. Um... I would even encourage you to find three others who think a little different than you. It'd be nice to have a Presbyterian, a Baptist, a Pentecostal, you know, and uh, someone who just calls himself a Christian, a non-labeled, you know, sugar-free, whatever, no-frills Christian. So grow in your faith. Find that book. If you need help with that, um, let me know. Uh, you can check out the, uh, <laughs> we call it the Life Group on Facebook. Um life, taking the journey with Christ. You can look me up on Facebook. Um, always sharing things there. Would love to help you get stronger in your walk with Jesus to uh, be more connected to the body. So it's the end of my day. I'm super tired. I'm not super focused. I hope this made sense. Uh, it's just a brain dump. And uh, yeah, look at the videos made in the morning for something that's a little more focused and uh, direct. So God bless you guys. Have a good one. Adios, amigos.